Electric Charges in Fields Introduction Common examples of electric discharge is the lightning that we see in the sky during thunderstorms. The reason for these experiences is discharge of electric charges through our body which are accumulated due to rubbing of insulating surfaces. Electrostatics deals with the study of forces, fields and potentials arising from static charges. Electric Charge It is observed that if two glass rods rubbed with wool or silk cloth are brought close to each other, they repel each other as shown in the figure A. Two plastic rods rubbed with cat's fur repelled each other in figure B but attracted the fur. On the other hand, the plastic rod attracts the glass rod in figure C and repels the silk or wool with which the glass rod is rubbed. The glass rod repels the fur. If a plastic rod rubbed with fur is made to touch two small pith balls suspended by silk or nylon thread, then the balls repel each other as figure D and are also repelled by the rod. A similar effect is found if the pith balls are touched with glass rod rubbed with silk in figure E. A dramatic observation is that a pith ball touched with glass rod attracts another pith ball touched with plastic rod as figure F. Therefore, it was concluded by different scientists that there were only two kinds of an entity which is called electric charge. The experiments on pith balls suggested that there are two types of electrification and we find that 1. Like charges repel and 2. Unlike charges attract each other. The property which differentiates the two kinds of charges is called the polarity of charge. A simple apparatus to detect charge on a body is the gold leaf electroscope, shown above. It consists of a vertical metal rod housed in a box with two thin gold leaves attached to its bottom end. When a charged object touches the metal knob at the top of the rod, the charge flows onto the leaves and they diverge. To understand how the apparatus works, fold white paper strips into half so that you can make a mark of the fold. Open the strip and iron it with the mountain fold up as shown. Hold the strip by pinching it at the fold. We can notice that the two halves move apart. This shows that the strip has acquired charge on ironing. Conductors and insulators. Some substances readily allow the passage of electricity through them. Others do not. Those which allow electricity to pass through them easily are called conductors. Most of the non-metals like glass, porcelain, plastic, nylon, wood offer high resistance to the passage of electricity through them. They are called insulators. Charging by induction When we touch a pith ball with an electrified plastic rod, some of the negative charges on the rod are transferred to the pith ball and it also gets charged. Thus, the pith ball is charged by contact. Let us now perform the following experiment. 1. Bring two metal spheres A and B supported on insulating stands in contact as shown in figure A. Bring a positively charged rod near one of the spheres, A, without touching the sphere. The free electrons in the spheres are attracted towards the rod. This leaves an excess of positive charge on the rear surface of the sphere B. Both kinds of charges are bound in the metal spheres and cannot escape. They therefore reside on the surfaces as shown in the figure. Now separate the spheres by a small distance while the glass rod is still held near sphere A as shown in the figure C. The two spheres are found to be oppositely charged and attract each other. Remove the rod. The charges on spheres rearrange themselves as shown in the figure D. Now separate the spheres apart. The charges on them get uniformly distributed over them in figure E. In this process, the metal spheres will be equal and oppositely charged. This is charging by induction. Basic properties of electric charge We know that there are two types of charges, namely positive and negative, and their effects tend to cancel each other. Some of the basic properties of electric charges are shown above. Forces between multiple charges The mutual electric force between two charges is given by Coulomb's law. How to calculate the force on a charge where there are not one but several charges around? Consider a system of n stationary charges Q1, Q2, Q3 and so on till Qn in vacuum. What is the force on Q1 due to Q2, Q3 and Qn? Coulomb's law is not enough to answer this question. Experimentally, it is verified that force on any charge due to a number of other charge due to the vector sum of all the forces on that charge due to the other charges taken one at a time 
the individual forces are unaffected due to the presence of other charges. This is termed as the principle of superposition. To better understand the concept, consider a system of three charges, that is Q1, Q2 and Q3, as shown in the figure. The force on one charge, say Q1, due to two other charges, Q2 and Q3, can be therefore obtained by performing a vector addition of the forces due to each one of these charges. Thus, if the force on Q1 due to Q2 is donated by F12, F12 is given by the equation shown above, even though other charges are present. Thus, the total force F1 on Q1 due to the two charges Q2 and Q3 is given by equation 2. The above calculation of force can be generalized to a system of charges more than 3 as shown in the figure. The principle of superposition says that in a system of charges Q1, Q2 and so on till Qn, the force of Q1 due to Q2 is the same as given by Coulomb's law. That is, it is unaffected by the presence of other charges Q3, Q4 and so on till Qn. The total force F1 on the charge Q1 due to all other charges is then given by the vector sum of the forces F12, F13 and so on till F1n. It is obtained as shown. Electric field. Let us consider a point charge Q placed in vacuum at the origin O. If we place another point charge at point P where OP equals R, then the charge Q will exert a force on Q as per Coulomb's law. When another charge Q is brought at some point P, the electric field produced by the charge capital Q at a point R is given as shown above in the equation 1. We obtain the force F exerted by a charge Q on charge small Q as shown in the equation 2. Thus, the electric field due to a charge capital Q at a point in space may be defined as the force at a unit positive charge would experience if placed at that point. The charge capital Q which is producing the electric field is called a source energy change and the charge small q which tests the effect of the source change is called a test charge. Electric field due to a system of charges. Consider a system of charges q1, q2 and so on till qn with position vectors r1, r2 and so on till rn relative to some origin O. The electric field at a point in space due to the system of charges is defined to be the force experienced by a unit test charge placed at that point without disturbing the original position of charges. We can use Coulomb's law and the superposition principle to determine this field at a point P denoted by position vector R. Electric field E1 at R due to Q1 at R1 is given by the equation 1. In the same manner, electric field E2 at R due to Q2 at R2 is given by the equation 2 by the superposition principle. The electric field E at R due to the system of charges is E of R equals E1 of R plus E2 of R and so on till E to the base N of R. E is a vector quantity that varies from one point to another point in space and is determined from the positions of the source charges. Electric field lines Michael Faraday introduced the idea of lines of forces. They are nothing but a way of pictorially mapping the electric field around a configuration of charges. It is the curve drawn in such a way that the tangent to it at each point is in direction of the net field at the point. An arrow on the lines of force is a must to indicate the direction of the electric field. Let us see the nature of the lines of force in the following cases. Case 1. If it is a positively charged body, then the electric lines of force are directed away from the body. If the body is negatively charged, then the lines of force are directed towards the body. Case 3. When two positively charged bodies are involved, the electric lines of force gives a vivid picture of mutual repulsion. Case 4. In the case of two equal and opposite charges, the lines of force clearly shows mutual attraction. The lines move from positive to negative. The figure above shows the lines of force due to an infinitely large sheet of positive. General properties of electric lines of force and field lines. General properties of electric lines of force or field lines are shown above. Electric flux. Electric flux is the number of electric field lines penetrating a surface or passing through a surface. The electric field can be uniform or non-uniform. Let us now try to find an electric flux passing through a surface when the field is uniform. Case 1. Uniform field. The figure shows field lines passing through a rectangular surface of area A perpendicular to the field lines. 
the electric flux passing through this surface is given by the product of electric intensity and the surface area perpendicular to the field lines. That is, phi equals Ea, where phi denotes electric flux, A denotes the surface area. Suppose the surface is not perpendicular to the field lines, then the electric flux is given by the equation phi equals Ea cos theta, where theta is the angle between the direction of the electric field E and the normal drawn to the surface in the outward direction. When the normal to surface is parallel to the electric field, as shown in the figure, the electric flux phi equals Ea cos theta, where theta equals 0 and phi equals Ea cos 0, therefore phi equals Ea. The electric flux becomes 0 if the normal to the surface is perpendicular to the electric field as shown in the figure. Case 2. Non-uniform field. Let us now calculate the electric flux passing through a surface when the applied field is not uniform. The surface is usually divided into a large number of small areas dA or delta A such that the electric field remains constant over the surface as shown in the figure. The total electric flux is obtained as shown above. Electric dipole. An electric dipole is a pair of equal and opposite point charges Q and minus Q separated by a distance to A. The field of an electric dipole. The electric field of the pair of charge at any point in space can be found out from Coulomb's law and the superposition principle. The results are simple for the following two cases. 1. When the point is on the dipole axis and 2. When it is in the equatorial plane of the dipole, that is on a plane perpendicular to the dipole axis through its centre. The electric field at any general point P is obtained by adding the electric fields EQ due to the charge minus Q and E plus Q due to the charge Q by the parallelogram law of vectors. Let us now look at both the cases. The magnitude of the electric fields due to the two charges plus Q and minus Q are given by the equation 1 and 2 are equal. The directions of E to the power plus Q and E to the base minus Q are shown in the figure. Clearly, the components normal to the dipole axis cancel away. The components along the dipole axis add up. The total electric field is opposite to P. Hence, we derive the above equation. Dipole on a uniform external field. An electric field is said to be uniform if the electric field strength at every point in the field is the same. Consider a permanent dipole of dipole moment P in a uniform external field E, which implies that P does not depend on E, nor is it induced due to E. The force on Q is QE and on minus Q is minus QE and net force on dipole is zero. However, the charges are separated so that the force act on different points giving rise to a torque on the dipole. When net force is zero, torque is independent of the origin. Its magnitude equals the magnitude of each force multiplied by perpendicular distance between the two anti-parallel forces. That is, magnitude of torque is obtained as shown above. From the above, it is found that an electric dipole placed in uniform electric field experiences a torque which aligns the dipole parallel to the direction of the electric field. Continuous charge distribution. A system of charges can be considered as a continuous distribution if the group of charges are located very close together. To find the electric field due to a continuous charge distribution, we have to define the following terms namely linear charge density that is lambda and surface charge density explained as shown above. Gauss's law. As a simple application of the notion of electric flux, let us consider the total flux through the sphere of radius r, which encloses a point charge q at its center. Divide the sphere into small area elements as shown in the figure. The flux through an area element delta s is given as shown in equation 1. Now since the normal to a sphere at every point is along the radius vector at that point, the area element delta s and r vector have the same direction. Therefore, equation 1 becomes equation 2 as shown. The total flux through the sphere is obtained by adding up the flux through all the different area elements represented in equation 3. Equation 4 is a simple illustration of general result of electrostatics called Gauss's law. Applications of Gauss's law Field due to an infinitely long straight uniformly charged wire. Consider an extremely long thin straight wire with uniform linear charge density lambda Suppose we take the radial vector from 0 to P and rotate it around the wire. The points P, P dash and P double dash so obtained are completely equivalent with respect to the charged wire. This implies that the electric field must have the same magnitude in these points. The direction of electric field at every point must be radial as shown above. Consider a pair of line elements P1 and P2 of the wire as shown. The electric fields produced by the two elements of the pair when summed to give a result in electric field which is radial. To calculate the field, imagine a cylindrical Gaussian surface as shown in the figure. 
Since the field is everywhere radial, flux through the two ends of the cylindrical Gaussian surface is zero. At the cylindrical part of the surface, E is normal to the surface at every point and its magnitude is constant. Since it depends only on R, the surface area of the curved part is 2 pi R L, where L is the length of the cylinder. Field due to a uniformly charged infinite plane sheet. Let sigma be the uniform surface charge density of an infinite plane sheet, as in the figure. We take the x-axis normal to the given plane. By symmetry, the electric field will not depend on y and z-coordinates and its direction at every point must be parallel to the x-direction. We can take the Gaussian surface to be rectangular parallelopiped of cross-section area A as shown. As seen from the figure, only the two faces 1 and 2 will contribute to the flux. Electric field lines are parallel to the other faces and they therefore do not contribute to the total flux.